Welcome, I'm Martin Minnick with the California Cybersecurity Institute. Today we're joined by Henry Danielson, adjunct professor at Cal Poly, director of technology for the Coast Unified School District, cybersecurity project manager for the SCCRC region, and a technology coordinator with us here at the CCI. Henry has a passion for teaching young people about technology and getting them access to the tools and resources they need to succeed in the industry. Henry, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Martin. I'm a really, really great chance to come here and talk to people about the passionate thing of cybersecurity as well as uh, our topic today. So uh, anyway, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to, to be here and be a part of it. Yeah, part of our mission here at the CCI is just really um, cyber awareness and cyber education. So today, what we really want to talk to you about is, can you kind of tell me the history of the dark web or the deep web? Sure. So another another term I like to call is the underbelly of the web. And the term, the actual deep web, was coined by a company in 2001 called Bright Planet. And it was an internet search technology company that specialized in deep web content. And what, what really inspired them was the military origins. Uh, this was based in the beginning from the military. And like other areas of the internet, the deep web began to grow in the U.S. military, specifically the actual uh, naval research laboratory. And what they were trying to do is be able to use uh, a technology that would not be um, uh, located by other officials working abroad. So they were trying to basically find another way that they could use um, a communication uh, way of the Internet, but so that no one else would be tapping into it and, and using it. Um, the Naval Research Laboratory began working on it uh, in 1995, and they called it the onion routing. And part of that was because they were peeling away layers and layers of the Internet and having you go deep into that dark dark component. The research developed into the Onion Router Project, or uh, better known as currently the Tor Project, which was in 1997, I believe. So um, the U.S. Navy actually released that code, the Tor code, um, to the public uh, in 2004, and a group of developers in 2006 called the Tor Project, imagine that, they kept the same name, um, released a service that is currently in use. So that's kind of a little bit of a, a history of the dark uh, deep web. If you take a look at this and think about it as an iceberg, um, the surface web is where we we travel mostly. Uh, the the dark web or the deep web, which I'll talk a little bit more about, they're they're in layers and that, and it gives a great visual of how to understand. But we're at the top topmost level of the surface level, and that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, well, great. Well, and that that really is kind of takes us to our next question. Help explain to our audience the difference between the dark web and the deep web? Because you're using some vernacular that maybe our audience hasn't heard before. Right. So so the, the going back to the deep web um, is the entire web that is not accessible by conventional browsers, right? So I talked a little bit about uh, the Tor browser. So um, conventional search engines, um, the dark web is a certain website within the deep web that is linked to criminal activity and illegal, mar illegal marketplaces. And again, you have to use this special Tor browser to be able to access that. So what does that look like? What that looks like on a, a laptop or you know a PC is you download the Tor browser and once you do that, it allows you to get on to the lower or the dark web. And without that browser, you can't travel. So for example, Chrome will not get you to those places. It does not get you there. So the deep web is anything that a search engine cannot find. Okay, so the crawlers and the web crawlers on the internet with Google and all the other ones, Yahoo and the other crawlers that are out there, they're unable to actually access that content. So the dark web then is classified as a small portion of the deep web that has been intentionally hidden and inaccessible by regular or what we call our normal browsers. Um, let's think about the difference between the deep web and the dark web many people use on the iceberg, which I talked about a little bit. The tip of that chunk of ice with respect to the dub 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 is where the surface web, or they also call it the clear net. So that's the places where most of us are surfing. Um, the surface web consists of websites like Google, Yahoo, Bing, those type of things um, are accessed and those search engines are able to see at that, that level. Um, what is interesting, and I wrote down this, the deep web is estimated that 90% of the web is hidden and not discoverable by search engines. This is what, again, we call the deep web. 
The dark web is estimated to only compromise 0.1 of the deep web portion of the total web. Much of the deep web consists of files not discoverable by search engine crawlers. So let's stop there and think about that. Those types of files not available to basically, not necessarily the public, but at that level of the web. So in order to gain access to that, again, we walk back to the Tor browser. You have to have access through the Tor browser. So Tor, what it does is obscures both the source and the destination IP address of the data packets by wrapping them around encrypted layers. So I know that sounds a little technical, but for the person or layman that doesn't really understand that, what's basically going on is when that pa packets travel from one component or one host or a computer to another, it actually is encrypted and has a wrapped file around it so no one can grab that packet um, the packet sniffer was one of my favorite terms on the planet, um, and be able to break down that packet to get in there. So um, I do think that when you're using the Tor browser and getting on those, you have to be really mindful of what you're trying to do on the dark and, and the deep web. Um, and we'll get in a little bit more uh, as we go down through the podcast of what's on there. But um, can anybody use it? That's another question and I think a lot of people will ask. Yes, anybody can go there, um, but you do need to be safe uh, with what you're doing and what your intentions are for going on the dark web. Yeah, when you, the common audience is looking at a uh, web interface, they think everything is available at the tip of their fingers. Mm -hmm. Can you go in a little bit deeper and talk about um, what is that 90% of data that's not on the surface web, what type of information? So their 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 databases, like Cal Poly's, for example, um, they're they're at the the middle level where there's a bunch of different databases that are on there. Um, but the, the parts that actually are with the Tor browser and underneath at the bottom layer, those files um, are encrypted through the Tor browser. So. There's lots of scary, scary things that are on that. Um, and we'll get in a little bit more, but just to give you a heads up, for example, you can go buy a degree on the dark web for right now, cur currently about $10,000 for a master's degree. So there's some really inappropriate, illegal activities um, that go through that area of the, the web. And the reason is, is because it's untraceable. It's really hard because your Tor browser hides you from anyone actually trying to find you. So, and our law enforcement agencies have a hard time finding these criminals because they're behind so many different layers, hence the onion layer in the Tor browser. Yeah, let me, let me, I know we're going to talk about the dark web separately, so let me spin you back a little bit. I'm really trying to get the differentiation between the deep web mm -hmm. and the dark web is why would I want to go on Tor and harvest um, deep web data to do... So those those databases that are on there do have public information, right? So there are places on that er, or in that area where you could actually get some of that data and use it for bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, bankings, you know, their databases are on that middle level. Those are databases that are not necessarily accessible or scrubbable by our normal search engines. However, if you get to that point, you can get some of that data. And that's where a lot of the hacking is actually going on is it's not necessarily on the dark web. They're trading and buying and purchasing and doing things of that nature. But on that aspect, they're actually trying to get credit cards. They're trying to get social security numbers. They're trying to get different things that are out there, but they're not penetratable unless they've been hacked or going to be hacked. No, I think that was, that was very that, helpful. That make, when you talk about how you can reach all this uh, protected information on the surface web, but everything that is sitting behind that layer of protection is really the deep web subject. That's right. Um, that's that's very helpful. W let's talk a little bit um, about the why it matters. Can you tell me what the what the impact this is having on the global uh, economy? Yeah. So, a couple things I looked up. So, <laughs> we're predicting right now the cyber crimes. Um, 
to the tune of six trillion cyber crimes, which means what is a cyber crime? Great question. Thanks for asking. You know, basically someone is doing some illegal activity and is usually gaining monetary or some kind of credibility from their hack or what they're doing. So again, six trillion by 2021. Um, and you can actually go right now on Wikipedia and search for a list of data breaches or data breaches. Um, and it'll give you a current list. And it is shocking, Martin. It is really amazing the daily amount of cyber crimes that are happening that the public does not know about because sometimes the companies don't actually tell of their cyber uh, crimes or the breach that actually happens for three to six months later until they actually figure out what it is and what had happened. So, and I always like to bring up too with our global economy, we really need to make this a priority. Our global economy, um, you can also go to cyber, um, uh, watch cyber threats actually happen in real time. Um, FireEye and there's other companies out there that have them, Norse attack maps that show that every country on the planet has a cyber team and we're all attacking each other. And that's really unfortunate because when it comes to those summits where all countries are involved, everyone in the room says we're not attacking, we're not doing this, but you can actually go on a public site and see that other people are breaching and other people on other countries and other different countries are actually doing that to each other. Um, so it's, it's it's kind of this weird thing that's going on, in my opinion, that no one wants to admit it, but we're actually all doing it. Yeah, the you know, a couple big things about point that it's uh, I want to make out is anybody that feels that you're a victim of cybercrime, there is an FBI uh, Internet Crimes Commission that you can report it to. You can le reach out to your local law enforcement uh, community. Um, the other thing is that the state and federal government are positioning themselves to respond and protect the community. Um, and you can see that with new uh, Cyber Strategy 2019, National Defense Strategy, um, what the California state is, or what the state of California is doing through the California Office of Emergency Services, California Highway Patrol, California Department of Technology, and the California Army National Guard is kind of the big four focused on protecting the uh, state from cybercrime and cyber terrorism. So there are, there is also a lot of positives uh, taking place within the community as well. Um, let me ask you. Um, Kind of why is there not being uh, policy or legislation developed to kind of inhibit or prevent this type of behavior? Well, before I answer that, I also want to mention that the bad threat actors, or that's another uh, term that they use in the cyber or computer security um, vernacular, are making a ton of money via ransomware, compromising identities, and also illegal activities. We want to make sure that we know that these guys and gals are making a lot of money and they're not getting caught. So I just wanted to make sure that we we know that, that these cyber threat uh, bad actors are out there and it's continuing to happen. Henry, but, can I... Yeah. Before you answer the next question, can I ask one thing? What can I, as a common web user, mm -hmm. do to protect myself? You know, uh, I think one of the best ones out there currently is actually using VPN, uh, virtual private network. And what that does is it basically gives you a cable or a tunnel that goes from your device um, and masks your identity for where you are. And what that does is it makes it really difficult for someone to penetrate your actual traffic on the network that you're using because it's a virtual private one. So I do think in the in the next five years, that's going to be a more mainstay of a lot of consumers. I, I would promote that I think that, you know, our local cable company should offer a VPN um, through their actual local home so that you can, you know, transfer files and do things safely. So that would be one of the first things I would say to protect yourself. Another thing is your mobile device, Martin. Your mobile device really needs to have clear uh, ways that you know for a fact if you download an app and it asks you to be able to turn on the mic, turn on the camera, and turn on your location, that you know those apps are actually doing that. And most of the applications will just ask you the first time you download it, we don't think anything of that, say yes. And now, for example, maybe this simple camera app that you have has turned on all of those things and is using that data 
later for you to market, uh, to sell to advertisers and those type of things. So I think two of the things I would really recommend is sitting down on your couch, going through every app on your phone. Yes, it does take a little bit of time, but looking at actually where those devices what applications they're using, or, or sorry, what parts of the application are they using? Are they using your phone, your sound, as well as your GPS location? If you don't need those on, you need to turn them off, and that would be that would be something I would highly recommend. Yeah, two things I thought were real interesting from that little segue we went off on. One of it is you're advertising for the local community to use a VPN. If you use a VPN, you're actually using deep web because that access, that information is not accessible to the surface layer. So that's a, a great example. Um, and the other thing is we're always ad advocating for simple cyber hygiene. Mm -hmm. um, you as a consumer just really need to take personal ownership uh, of your own privacy and, and the, the tools and uh, applications that you're using. And I really appreciate that advice. Let's spin it back around okay. to... Let's talk. Let's talk policy and legislation. Why is it not happening, and and what are what is being done about it? So currently, law enforcement and the cyber criminals or the bad actors are constantly racing to pay, outpace each other and stay one step ahead. Um, part of that big problem is, and I'll just give you an example. Um, forensics analysts. Um, are told or given tools to be able to get on a mobile device, right? Let's say the, the criminal has done something inappropriate and it's on their mobile device. The law enforcement has been given a tool to be able to try to get on that. However, <laughs> mobile device manufacturers are constantly changing that way to be able to get on that device because they feel it's a privacy that they don't want anyone to be able to get past. So what happens is the tools that are created, they're being outpaced by the manufacturers of the mobile devices. So the mobile device owner, or, or sorry, manufacturers, by the time there's a tool out there for law enforcement to stop the bad actors or the threat actors to be able to do that, that's a problem. So in 2017, two online black markets were shut down by authorities that are slowly chipping away at the legal activity. There's much more resources required to investigate dark web crime and also is much harder to prosecute, which are big blows to the investigations. So currently our legislative uh, folks and laws and compliance, we're having a really hard time as law enforcement to be able to enforce and be able to get that data or that data off the devices and be able to use it. And again, I go back to my first statement was outpacing each other. The bad actors are finding ways to get in to the back door. Uh, maybe one example is a smart TV. I bet you someone on this podcast or that's listening has a smart TV. More than likely, it jumps on the World Wide Web. OK, if that does that, there could be also data that it's collecting from your usage of your television, what programs you're watching, all these different things that are in the U end user license that we may not think about. So going back to um, enforcing the laws, um, other countries, rules and regulations are also hard um, because we all have our own way of managing those type of laws. So Monero is a cryptocurrency um, is gaining popularity with criminals because of its tighter privacy mechanisms. So cryptocurrency is one of the other ways that we're not able to uh, basically police or find out who sold or bought a gun on the dark web and did that because it's masked in so many ways that they're unable to actually find out who owns that cryptocurrency. So the Department of Homeland Security is interested in trying to learn more about this technology so they can track these um, these coins um, or these crypto coins or cryptocurrency, sorry. Yeah, I think a, a key takeaway to that is the amount of time it takes to create legislation and policy um, is superseded or overwhelmed by the cycle of evolution on the digital frontier. There's something new out. There's some new tool out. There's some new process out. Um, there's some new vulnerability, and it takes a while for the legislative process to catch up. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to also talk a little bit about our um, our forensics lab here at the CCI, where 
we were able to, well, not myself, but but uh, the team over there was able to use forensics. And it was actually a case on the dark web and it was on uh, a very famous uh, television program. And they actually walked through how a young man had purchased um, a hitman to try to get rid of one of his family members. And all of that was used um, in bad course because they were using the dark web to hire criminals to be able to outsource, you know, outsource them and be able to do something really bad to a human. And our forensics team was able to uh, go through that. And it actually happened in Palm Springs. Um, and we were actually, um, you know, part of that part of that team to be able to, to bring that down. I know you know about that, Martin, but uh, another great thing that our, our law enforcement is able to do, but again, the amount of work and the amount of laws um, almost protecting the criminals. I hate to say that, but 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 it, it, it's such a hard thing for us to get done. Yeah, which is kind of a, like, you know, not to close it out with kind of an introduction on all the bad things you can do on the dark web, but to let the community have awareness of what is happening on the dark web. Can you kind of mm -hmm. just break down what services and what transactions are currently transpiring on that 1% of the deep web right. called the and, dark web? And again, your Tor browser gets you on there. Um, there's videos how to do it safely to be able to do that. And it's just an interesting question, Martin, because Right now, I think I talked a little bit about you can go on the dark web and get a master's degree for about $10,000. Another thing that's really interesting on there is the um, guns and other uh, inappropriate content, uh, fake documentation. You're able to get social security numbers. I think the last time I checked a credit card, which they also sell, a number might have three or four grand on it. You can get those for about $12. So they'll give you a list of credit card numbers that actually are legit and work and can tap directly into those accounts. And, you know, those are such a, a crazy thing. And we're having better technologies and I applaud the the monetary folks that, and the credit card companies and the banking industry for trying to make those so that that doesn't happen because it's it's become to the point where you can actually get those really easily as well as um, driver's licenses, um, personal information documents, um, financial fraud sites um, where you can actually build and grab a, a site and use it to get monetary people to purchase and do things. And the money goes directly into cryptocurrency that's not traceable. So those, those are deep, dark web things that are also available. Um, so I think that some of the illegal operations have been very successful and they are used today. And we need to really give the, the public an, a little bit of knowledge that there's people out there that are getting jobs that really don't have the credentials. And, and to me, that's really just a, just a not a good thing that we have out there because you really want the people with those degrees and other things to, to be professionals with that. So those are some of the things that, um, I, I've been blown away. And of course, the, the bad stuff with pornography as well as drugs. I didn't really talk about drugs. And that is something that is very common uh, on, on the web, on the dark web. And it's really sad, but those things are happening on a regular basis. Well, I, th I think the topic today has been absolutely fascinating. Um, we're excited to have you back for another uh, um, discussion on various topics. I know your passion is educating the youth. Um, and, and this is one way that you do it, just having the subject matter expertise to explain it, um, to maybe the non-technically, mm -hmm. um, deep individual in the community, but, you know, at the California Cybersecurity Institute, that's kind of our mission and that's what we're here to do and we're happy to have you. So thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thanks. And I just wanted to close with, uh, my, my last couple little passions, uh, we're having, a. California Cyber Innovation Challenge, where we're going to have 200 high school and junior high kids here competing and working together as a team, collaborating. Uh, they're going to be our next generation or our future cyber leaders in our community. And I think it's really important that uh, anybody that's involved with young people to give them a chance to try to do that. And one of the ways we're doing that is creating a crypto badge uh, that's uh, a bear, our local uh, or our state bear. And I'm really trying to get young people also understanding how 
electronics and engineering and crypto uh, are part of our current infrastructure and part of our landscape. So I'm really excited that our high school students are currently designing, Martin, right now, a badge. Um, and I hope that comes to fruition and we get to talk about that at some other time. Uh, but badge life is definitely a great thing that's in uh, the community of crypto uh, as well as um, cyber professionals and computer security. So anyway, thank you again for today. I had a really good time and I hope uh, some, some people learned some stuff today. It's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. The CCI offers cybersecurity training for industry professionals at a competitive price point in live immersive environments. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to learn more about the CCI and cybersecurity, or you'd like to enroll in one of our training courses, visit our website at cci.calpoly.edu today. Thank you, and we'll see you again soon.